Namaskar, I'm Vanishri Banerjee, and it is my privilege to welcome panelists and participants uh, to this webinar on behalf of INHA. This, as you know, is number 54 in the series of webinars on Rethinking Cities. Some of you may have participated in the previous webinar, but many have joined for the first time. So I will take a few minutes to introduce INHA and the series before we proceed with today's uh, discussions. INHAF or Habitat Forum is a national level membership organization and it has uh, a variety of membership such as NGOs, professionals, academics, activists as members. Yeah, as the name implies, INHAF works in the field of human settlements and as a forum uh, that brings together diverse groups, such as government, uh, civil society organizations, uh, communities, education and research institutions, and businesses. Uh, the idea is to collectively work towards alternatives and innovations uh, to overcome uh, uh, systemic constraints and uh, to uh, utilize opportunities towards building uh, inclusive, productive, and sustainable urban and rural habitats. In its three decades of uh, existence, INHAF uh, has taken several steps in this uh, direction, I'm happy to say. Uh, this webinar uh, series, themed as Rethinking Cities, is very much part of INHAF's efforts in collective thinking and uh, sharing of experiences and ideas. So from June uh, 2020, more than 300 people have discussed and shared perspectives um, on a number of issues. This includes experts, uh, but also migrant workers, trade union leaders, uh, specialists, planners, economists, slum dwellers, uh, development thinkers, young professionals, everyone. And uh, many more have joined in as participants and enriched the process with uh, questions, comments, and much food for thought. So what is the logic behind the webinar series? To answer this question, I will fall back on uh, the words of uh, Kiki Shah, who initially thought of a magic number of 30 webinars. But now we are at 54 and many more are planned. Kirti said the logic behind 30 and even more webinars is uh, to adequately handle the complexity of the subject, rethinking cities. One or two would have left much uh, unsaid and unaddressed and many questions unasked. So we are still uh, going through this process of uh, saying, addressing. Me, my, my start. So, uh, but such an ambitious uh, initiative could not have been implemented by INHAP alone. And uh, the series is a joint effort of INHAP and a number of uh, professionals and organizations who have joined us. And Studio INHAP has been uh, set up to coordinate the series, uh, while, uh, which is uh, quite a huge amount of work, as Ankisha will tell you, while each webinar is anchored by any of the partners. The focus uh, is on Indian cities, but that does not mean that the webinars are restricted to Indian speakers and participants. Uh, the events have, have a mix of people and experiences from India and elsewhere, and uh, many of them have been anchored by international organizations. This has really enriched the process of reflection and learning. Uh, the webinars are uh, part of a much needed societal dialogue on how we handle organization processes and develop cities so that they remain engines of economic growth, minus uh, their exploitative instinct and elements and system. The need for this is not new, but as we know, the pandemic has intensified the inconsistencies, divides, 
and fragility of social, economic, and governance processes, and set in an urgency which was perhaps not there before. Actually, many initiatives and policies already exist. Perhaps uh, we need to connect the disconnected. And that is where societal dialogues can be of help. But holding webinars is, is of course not an end in itself. Uh, the webinar series of INHAP is an integral part of an initiative uh, that was launched in uh, 2019 by INHAP. It is called CITIURI, uh, Citizens Urban Initiative. CITIURI is a multi-level and multidisciplinary societal effort uh, spearheaded by some of India's leading urban professionals, development thinkers, and practitioners. The aim uh, of City Uri is to work on the country's response uh, to the com complex development challenges in a way that ensure productive, inclusive, sustainable, and livable cities, uh, towns, as well as villages. As a first step, INHAF has started to work. Uh, uh, to assimilate uh, the takeaways from the webinars into knowledge products and policy guidance. As we go along, we hope to keep the partnerships built during the webinars in an active part of our work. With this brief introduction, I urge you to visit the website of INHA for announcements and links to webinars and other initiatives. And today we are fortunate to have uh, with us a multifaceted and experienced panel of experts on an extremely important and topical subject that is supporting and strengthening civil society in addressing the urban challenge. And in that, the critical role of CSR, corporate social responsibility and philanthropy for a way forward. But before we go ahead, I will take a moment to introduce today's uh, anchor, Nilima Keta, who is a senior CSR and social sector expert. Uh, she has over three decades of experience in this space and has uh, worked with uh, both um, leading uh, for-profit and non-profit organizations in the country, which is a very rare feat. Currently, she is affiliated as visiting fellow with Center for Social and Economic uh, Progress, which was earlier called Bootings India, and as partner, news uh, consultants. In the past, uh, Nilivaji has held uh, leadership positions in the social sector and served on the boards of many NGOs and academic institutions. She was also um, an acting director of IRMA her alma mater. She has been a member of several uh, central and state government committees, including uh, the Land Reforms Committee of the Government of India and uh, panels and uh, task forces of uh, the Planning Commission earlier. Coming to the corporate world, uh, Nilima was Director of CSR and Sustainability for Coca-Cola India and South Asia. After which, uh, she was Vice President uh, uh, CSR at Hindustan Zing, and at the same time, CSR head for the entire Vedanta group, consisting of uh, 11 uh, different uh, uh, companies. And whether negotiating CSR funding uh, in corporate boardrooms or in other roles, Nilima Khetan has proved herself to be a champion of social development, and we are very happy to welcome her. With this, I uh, hand over uh, to Nilima Khetan to take forward today's proceedings. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Banishri. That was very, very kind of you. Uh, thank you very much. And I am indeed privileged and excited to be here today with, the, with this uh, Outstanding panel. Uh, as I was, as I was telling Keithi ji earlier, we could not have thought of a more uh, all-rounded, balanced panel than the one that we have today. Experts from all fields to talk about this challenge. So, 
just one or two words from my side in the beginning before I hand it over to the panel. Uh, and I feel that this, uh, this webinar, why I am so interested and excited about it. Uh, so a lot of us have been talking about the, uh, the urban challenge as it exists and the way it is likely to become even more of a challenge going forward. More and more of us are living in urban spaces, working in urban spaces, more and more of inequality and informality happens in the urban spaces. Uh, much more of the uh, carbon footprint, energy consumption, uh, pollution happens through urban spaces. So all of those are challenges that many people, uh, many of us have become aware of and talk about. But also the other aspect of the urban spaces, which I think the pandemic pushed into popular kind of horizon and imagination like never before was the alienation that happens in urban spaces. The reason why hundreds and thousands and thousands of migrants chose to the images of migrants leave, turning their backs in the cities and walking away, there could not have been more of a living whatever, it's not a testimony, it's a negative uh, reflection on the fact that our urban spaces are, there is no sense of belonging in these spaces. Uh, the inhospitability of these urban spaces, the lack of identity for more of the poor, I would say. Maybe the middle class also feels alienated. I can't say that, but certainly the poor for them, city is not the place where they find themselves, uh, as I said, there's no sense of identity, there's no sense of belonging. So we have to, and we can't have more and more people living in places with no, no sense of self and identity. That, apart from anything that it does to them, it is also a kind of a uh, dangerous situation, dangerous way to compose society. So anyways, I, I, I think, uh, that those are, that's the kind of problems that we are talking about. And on the other hand, unfortunately, urban spaces are spaces which have uh, been deficit in terms of not enough civil society works in urban spaces and certainly not enough funds flow. And CSR funds particularly do not flow as much to urban spaces. And I can understand a rural problem is large and uh, needs attention. Uh, so I am very excited. We have, you know, today amongst the best civil society uh, representatives working in urban spaces with us. We have uh, two representatives from CSR with us who can tell us about, you know, how these priorities are determined or otherwise. And we have two people who, while involved in, uh, who, who are really multi, multi-dimensional in the most rooted sense. Uh, who have a perspective on the larger uh, larger systems view also. So I'm really delighted and looking forward. Um, to begin with, however, uh, I'm going to request Keithi G uh, to give a kind of an opening uh, presentation on what the urban challenge is. Uh, so he will take uh, about 10 minutes to do that. And after that, we will uh, go to the panel and I'll introduce each of the illustrious panelists as they speak. Um, so for now, just to quickly introduce Keithi ji, uh, even though most of you must know him. Uh, I, I, I first came to know Keithi ji when I started working in this sector. And for me already, he was then a towering figure in the sector and he continues to be that. I knew him then because as the, uh, as the founder of ASAG, Ahmedabad Study Action Group. Uh, but he's devoted his life to urban spaces and urban problems. He was part of the Prime Minister's National Commission on Urbanization in mid eighties. He's chaired a working group on urban poverty in India. He was an advisor to Government of India's housing project for war victims in Sri Lanka. He's chaired uh, committees for HATCO, uh, the list goes on and on, and he's, of course, the founding president of INHAF. Uh, so I will, uh, his full bio will appear in the chat, but I uh, want to now request uh, Keithi ji if he can please take us through the kind of keynote opening. Thank you very much, Keithi ji. 
thank you, thank you, Nilima ji. Uh, uh, I normally, I normally do what uh, Banashi did today in terms of introducing uh, this webinar series. Uh, we've been doing this for last uh, 14 months, and this is 54th, and we hope to kind of do many more. So uh, I'm very delighted that you know I'm this time not I think introducing, but I'm sitting in as as a part of the panel. Now I. Uh, uh, what I intend doing is this, that, you know, Nilimaji asked me to kind of, you know, uh, introduce, I think, the urban challenge. And I think, you know, I'm going to kind of do this, you know, uh, both nationally and internationally. Uh, and I think I'll start with this very interesting, I think, you know, quote, which uh, I uh, very much, you know, like, uh, uh, which, which basically starts by saying that, uh, just a sec, uh, that uh, this is the quotation from Habitat 2, which says, as we approach the new millennium, uh, the urbanization holds out both the bright promise of an unequal future and the grave threat of unparalleled disaster, on which it will be depends on what we do today. And then it says, unless a revolution and urban problem solving takes place, uh, the future, if not bleak, is uncertain. This is what Global Report on Human Settlement said in 1996. What is talked about was the early decisive action and revolutionary approach to problem solving as its prescription to avoid what they call unparalleled disaster. And therefore the question is, is this urgency visible anywhere? Is revolution in urban problem solving in the making? That was the, the, what United Nations said 20 years ago. I'm now sharing what the civil society group said in, a, in, a, in, in, in what was called a Quantum Declaration some 30 members of civil society from Asia got together in Canton some 15 years ago. It's a small town in Malaysia to talk about Asia's urban future. And they coined Asian cities as economically productive, socially just, culturally vibrant, politically participatory and environmentally sustainable. This was the Panchila that was thought about at that point of time. And then over the years, we added three more, which is ecologically sensitive, technologically progressive and adaptive and people-centric and inclusive. This is the kind of civil society vision of Asia's cities. And I'm Believe me, I'm very proud of this because I was part of this process and very deeply involved in the making this. Let me kind of come quickly move to what our cities are. And I'm talking about diabolic nature and contrasting picture of our cities. Cities on the one hand are engines of economic growth and places where wealth takes place. They're centers of technology, innovation, employment and globalized world. They also are crucible of arts, culture, knowledge, and science. They also last resort of hope and livelihood for those trying to escape rural poverty. This is the picture of cities, bright, good picture of the city. And cities account anywhere for 65 to 70% of country's GDP now and they will touch 70% in 15, 20 more years. And anywhere between 70 to 90% of all government revenue comes from cities. This is one part, this is the one dimension, this is the one face of cities. Second is cities occupy just 2% of the earth's land mass, but they consume 75% of resources and throw 75% of the waste in environment. 
They are guzzlers of resources and big time polluters. Urban population growth had been staggering in our case. We were 64 million in 1950, 377 million in 2011, and are expected to be 828 million in 2050. Huge, staggering growth. Cities also hide deep poverty, deprivation, and often display inhuman living conditions. They display glaring inequality and they are big contributors to greenhouse gases and, and, and climate change. I'll, my next slide is, uh, is a story of uh, India's three capitals. And I like telling this story because I think it symbolizes in terms of what is not working well for our cities. It talks about first India's finance capital, Mumbai. And it says more than 50% of Bombay's population lives in slums, and that's the wealth capital of the country. Second is the Delhi, which is the political capital of the country. And its air quality is such that the Delhi High Court at one point of time described Delhi as guest chamber. And our third capital, religious, spiritual capital is Varanasi. And Ganga is so polluted that we require a special ministry and we have been struggling it for the last 40 years. So the thing that one is trying to say is this, and this is not running down all that is good that is happening, but if your finance capital, if your political capital, if your religious capital are the places you have not been able to handle, how have you handled your small cities and towns? So it basically is very important kind of statement on the manner in which we have handled our cities. Now, India's response to, uh, to, to the urban challenge has been less than adequate. Cities are often example of what they should not be. And why is one saying this? There are, because there are multiple inadequacies and underperformance in many sectors of city planning and development and take anything. You take governance, you take municipal finance, population growth, its partial distribution, sustainability, environment, waste management, river, climate change, just think about anything and we are struggling. Uh, and just take a very quick example. We're talking about investment of, this is the estimation that came we're talking about $640 billion for urban infrastructure in 20 years. And under JNNURM, we were able to spend just 14 billion in 10 years. We had a huge problems of mobilization of resources and we had problems with our spending capacity. 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment held as watermark, what, what, what a very important changes and, 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 and uh, innovations and uh, changes. It's now 25 years and there has been really little program, uh, progress on that. And we have seen worse form of living condition in slums, side by side with posh gated communities and almost vulgar display of inequality in our cities. What one is saying is this, the approaches, strategies, and solution that will make cities better places to live and work do not seem to have been found. City is a place of residence and work and city as economy that produces growth and GDP are in focus of planners and investors, but city as people is lost thought over and neglected while planning, investing and developing. Of course, government is there. There are projects, programs, and investments is happening. As a matter of fact, now it's bigger and more ambitious than ever before. We have Pradhan Mantri Gavi Nawaz Yojana, we have Smart City, Amrut, Swachh Bharat, Metro, BRTS, JNNURM, the list is very long. They are there, and they're also improving conditions, you know, uh, locally. But they do not look like delivering on the 
overall challenge. PMAY is not reducing the housing stress or impacting, impacting on the land prices or rents or changing the living conditions in slums in Mumbai. So it's happening, but it's not changing the, the scenario as it's required. Now, what is the urban challenge and how does one see it? It's a channeling of urbanization process and planning of the cities in a manner that ensures, and this is a long but interesting list, ensures equitable economic growth, sustainable development, and equal opportunity to all citizens. It addresses issues of poverty, inequality, and employment effectively, preserves environment and environmental resources, respects ecology, balances modernity with tradition, puts technological advances to creative use, protects cultural heritage and social diversity, and preserves human values, and nurtures new norms of democratic, participatory, equitous, and just society. This is one of the very important dimension of our development challenge facing India. Question is, can the government do this alone? Can the market deliver this goal? And can this be done without wider societal partnership? There's another important thing that I wanted to kind of bring out, this is rarely talked about, that Indian urbanization is very, very special. And we've got to be talking about city not as a place, but city as a new society. And that is because urban to rural transition in India is much more than demographic shift or change in nomenclature or a new place for living for the people. It's a new society we are creating and becoming and a good number of people are struggling to cope and adjust to the demands of the change. For many, it's a new economy, new marketplace, new behavior pattern, new ways of earning a living, new skill sets, new kind of relations, and new socio-cultural norms. It's important, therefore, that the new society is more equal, less exploitative, in harmony with the nature, environmentally and ecologically sustainable, and more humane and compassionate. This is the human people part of, of, of urbanization, urban development. And then the question is, is the societal transformation to be led and managed by real estate professionals and consultants alone? Or it is because more than infrastructure and mobility and housing, it is a city, not only as a place, it is a city as people. Now, in the context of way forward, I don't really have time to kind of go into all the details. So I jump on this that we talked about that our response to urban challenge has been less than adequate. And this improper response entails a very heavy price socially, environmentally, and economically. If cities are producing growth, and if cities are the ones which are improving quality of living, if we don't respond properly, this is the price you pay. What is even more important to note is this, that the traditional actors who must respond to the challenge do not look like taking up the challenge or leading it. Neither the government, nor academic community, nor professionals, nor business seem to be doing this. And what one is saying is this, that this work need to be done by broadly defined civil society. They, it could take up the challenge to shape a wider societal, societal partnership. And it also should lead to a more creative new partnership between the state and the people. Civil society has the knowledge, skills, and wherewithal for the purpose. I don't think it requires to be proved. It will need resources for mobilization and work. 
while that happens simultaneously, the government needs to start the process of alternative search at its own end, as was done in mid eighties through national commission and urbanization. If there is some time, I will talk about this later on. I, because I've talked about a larger slice of role for civil society in terms of leading this, this new transformation process, I also must say there are traditional roles that civil society could play. We are all familiar with this welfare and charity, last mile connectivity, uh, welfare contracting, community organization, mobilization work for problem solving and collective capacity building, feedback on government's welfare and development programs and mid co correction intervention for delivery system improvement, a watchdog role in planning, investment and development action, both public and private policy advocacy and activism alternative development model. And I think, you know, a large number of areas require this to, this to basically brings uh, end to my, uh, what I call an introduction to the urban challenge. Uh, 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 I would no, I'm not say the word about uh, uh, role and expectation from corporate social responsibility and philanthropy. If I get a little more time, I'll come back to it because we're working on it and it's a subject on which I'm very much interested. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keetiji. That was really uh, very tight and uh, excellent capsule for any anybody wanting a quick overview into the kinds of, and it's a frightening picture that you draw. Um, we will now move into our panel. Uh, and the first person that if I may request to speak is uh, Shrikant. Uh, Shrikant is the Chief Executive Officer of Janagrahe. And as many of you will know, Janagrahe is one of the most uh, well-known organizations working in this space. And they are, they've been committed to for years to just deepening urban democracy. And um, Shrikant is, has an interesting background. The full bio will come in the, in the chat, but he's a finance person who's moved into playing this central leadership role into uh, a, in a civil society organization at Janagre. Uh, so over to you, Shrikant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nilima. Uh, I'll probably focus a little bit more on the role of CSR in philanthropy and less on the uh, urban problem, which Kirtiji has already uh, elaborated on. Uh, and I'll also try and cover uh, failures, challenges, and risks that I see presently, and what kind of reorientation is required for us to move uh, towards a new trajectory, a new way of uh, thinking. See, uh, I think three or four key issues, and I'll separate them out between CSR and philanthropy because the two are also quite uh, different. In the case of CSR, besides, of course, some of the more tactical issues like City is not really finding a place uh, in the law, and therefore reluctance of uh, corporates to, uh, you know, to, to kind of uh, invest in civil society organizations working in cities. I think we need to recognize that overall, at least from my personal standpoint, I'm not very sure whether CSR has been a force for good or bad. It certainly has a possibility of being a force for good. Uh, and the reason I'm saying is, I think. If we think of this as a uh, as a long journey of transformative change, of fixing India's cities, then it is more like some of the intractable challenges that humanity has been trying to address, whether it is gender equality or it is uh, climate change or water and sanitation or you know racial justice and so on. Uh, because ultimately, it's about fixing democracy and citizenship uh, in in several thousand communities and places uh, around India. Uh, and so we may have covered a long distance since the CSR law came into place, but we don't know whether we've covered that distance in the right direction. And I think that's an important question to ask and address. Therefore, a 
lot of money has been spent a lot of grants and donations have been made a lot of activities and outputs have been accomplished but have they been in the right direction or not is an important question to ask and i think that is still uh, that is still open as far as philanthropy is concerned i can see uh, i can see a short termism that is actually creeping i transitioned to the sector about 10 years ago 10 years ago when i joined janagraha conversations were predominantly around transparency citizen participation civic engagement and so on and i remember uh, ramesh our co-founder uh, telling me because i had joined municipal finance program that i don't think you should expect advocacy and reforms to get uh, funded it will have to be you know kind of corpus funded and a lot of the funding will come for transparency and citizen participation work and 10 years later we are in an ironic situation where funding is coming in not for advocacy but for reforms and i'll and i'll tell you why that that's not great news either but there is literally no funding for work on transparency citizen participation anti corruption etc that funding is just dried up pretty much completely including organizations that have funded us in the past in those areas have kind of shifted their uh, focus away from those uh, areas and the reason i said that the funding for reforms is also not great news is because a lot of it is basically getting co-opted into subsidizing efforts of government and not really strengthening government and holding it accountable for what it needs to do in the first place so for large philanthropic foundations are very happy getting co-opted and being seen working with governments which is not a bad thing i'm not saying that's that's inherently a bad thing but it can't be about subsidizing for government efforts which means you're not doing any systems change uh, i know large philanthropic organizations which you know which only subsidize for government efforts right and that's not part of a larger agenda which means you actually pay salaries for people because government does not have you know either money to pay salaries or does not have enough number of people to do certain tasks similarly subsidizing technology and so on which i think is quite wasteful frankly it's quite wasteful secondly i think there's there's uh, there's distraction in the philanthropic ecosystem with what i see as interesting ideas but perhaps are also passing fancies it could be social enterprises it could be you know uh, startups in the space uh, it could be uh, you know certain financial instruments uh, to raise capital and so on uh, whereas at least some of us who are working in the sector don't really see the lack of innovation as being the central problem we have to fix the basic basics in fact we we have to get back to the basics so this is the second problem that i see which is some kind of a distraction or the urge to do something new every 3 4 years and not really stay the course for a long period of time uh and the third is i think we're trying to apply too many corporate methods and i'm saying this with uh, with responsibility because i spent about 10 years in the corporate sector i've now spent 10 years in the development sector and i you could say i'm more than a total convert right now and i and i really think we need a greater infusion of development sector leadership in the corporate sector than vice versa i see a lot of emphasis among philanthropists and an orientation among philanthropists to focus a lot on getting corporate methods into the development sector but i think that's that's resulting in some of the challenges that i called out right now and this urge for short termism is perhaps coming from there the urge to say that in 3 years or 5 years uh we can actually fix the problem and there are you know there are uh there are leaders who you know who focus a lot either on 3 years or 5 years or even solving some of these monu- very large challenges within one's own lifetime i think there's a lot lot of humility that is needed in approaching some of these challenges and uh, and problems which i see missing uh, uh increasingly among philanthropists so uh, uh the the time frames that are being set if you invest in a series of 3 year activities right to solve a 20 year challenge i think it can be counterproductive 
you'll end up you know uh, you'll end up going around like headless chicken or you may end up going in the wrong direction and many times uh, and this is a challenge that many of us my team members and i face if we are 100% grant funded you don't have the backstop of a large philanthropist who tells you look you know here is a lot of money please stay the course and be patient if you don't have access to that many of us many of us have challenges in ensuring that we don't deviate from our mission and yet get adequately funded right how do you how do you make sure that you don't go the way funding is going but funding comes the way you're going and i sometimes feel i, I mean I, i don't mean to sound immodest but if i many of us take our missions quite seriously and we do recognize that our mission will outlast our own lives sometimes or many times and i feel that if the challenge is so small that it can be solved in 3 or 5 years then it is not a challenge worth solving we are not being humble enough about these challenges you are solving citizenship and democracy in a country of this size in more than 4500 cities where every small community is a is a mini democracy of sorts then you have to be humble about it and if i think of you know if i think of this as three tiers of saying ultimately the people who will deliver change will be communities and then there are intermediary organizations you know like ourselves ngos and others supporting them and then there are philanthropists supporting us uh, in that sense i think communities have to have to be put at the forefront the more you take the more philanthropists take themselves seriously and the more civil society organizations like us take ourselves very seriously i think there's a problem we are all agents of change we are not principals the principles are governments and communities i think that recognition is missing so philanthropists are you know seeking to justify their own organizational ex- existence institutional brand and so on that problem uh, can even overcome folks like us so i don't want to say philanthropists alone are to blame if blame it's important that civil society organizations also realize that we are only agents that we are not principals therefore what can be done to change this i think we need to put communities and local self governments at the heart of fixing our cities and not take a sectoral approach solving for a city is not solving for water is not solving for sanitation is not solving for transport etc it's solving for place and people kirti ji spoke about both the significance of this and the challenges but you need to take a a place based and people based approach and not just a sectoral approach and for this to happen we need to strengthen our municipalities we need to strengthen our ward committees we need to strengthen our area sabhas we need to give voice and agency to people in the place where they live and that i think is completely absent for us to jump directly to giving voice and agency to neighborhood level communities is a difficult prospect in the indian context because our municipalities themselves are disempowered and therefore these two have to go hand in hand how do you empower our local self governments and make them governments of the city where as a citizen of the city i am able to hold my elected body the elected council directly accountable and second how can i exercise voice and agency towards that end and towards shaping my own neighborhood in my neighborhood why is it that i don't have a voice on what the empty plot of land in my neighborhood should be used for how how you know uh, how then do you achieve the balance between equity environmental sustainability and economic growth how will this balance be achieved without engagement without building trust and engagement at the grassroots level where citizens and communities are able to engage with their elected councillors and board level officials to shape neighborhoods i really don't see any other way out i am biased in saying it because this is at the core of janagraha's own work which is in our name citizenship and democracy but i really don't see any other shortcuts i'm not undermining the need for sectoral work we do need experts in health and water etc but the fabric we need to strengthen the fabric and that fabric essentially is the interaction and engagement between elected officials at the hyper local level communities and and public officials and therefore unless csr and philanthropy recognizes the need to put communities and local self governments at the heart of fixing cities i don't think we will gain adequate speed or even find the right direction back to you nilima thank you very much shikant i really appreciate uh, many of the points that you brought out uh, i've been involved in a study that i've just closed at brookings at csep which was 
looking at the coming together of the for profit and the not for profits and what they what that has done to the conversations in the space especially around governance impact and other things and two things that you said i just want to under, uh, which is a pattern that we found in the study also one is the short termism that you spoke about uh, so it's not just in the urban spaces but universally across everywhere and it's also led by our desire to see concrete results impact in a short period of time which is also pushing this short termism and the other is the shift towards sectoral uh there was a time when community used to be at the center and it was considered that that was the right right approach but now increasingly you will see more and more of, of solutions that are sectoral many many of the things that you said uh, also about distractions and other things she can uh, and i just want to say one more thing i i had my understanding is that between csr and philanthropies you can possibly have i feel a greater space within philanthropies to worry about the long term a greater space within philanthropies to be not sectoral but to you know uh, define the problem more in a more complex way uh, so that's that so i would like to distinguish between csr and philanthropies i think there's a potential there and on that note maybe let's move to sangeeta uh, sorry shrikri yes neelima i just want to make one small thing. so i think uh, also the artificial distinction between urban and rural rather than taking a regional approach is also one of the challenges that we are facing and the focus on communities and local self governments both urban and rural what that will do yeah. is make sure that regional linkages between urban and rural are taken you know seriously and this is really important even for environment and equity Uh, the, a, a village that neighbors a city has uh, 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 has organic linkages. Had both, both of them have organic link, yeah. linkages rather than two cities which are three hundred, four hundred, five hundred kilometers I, apart. I, I agree. And governance systems are common. Yeah. yeah. So uh, and on that note, I would like to move to sorry, uh, she uh, to Sangeeta. Um, Sangeeta is uh, is working with Sneha. uh which is again an an urban uh, uh non-profit which is working closely with communities in mumbai and now beyond mumbai and recently why i am saying it's a nice segue from what you where you ended shikant to uh, sneha at least in one respect sneha was recently in the news as one of the recipients of the of the mckenzie scott grant uh where the where what she says in that grant is the idea that let the people who are at the forefront decide priorities and not the third tier which is a philanthropy which she can't mention but over to you sangeeta for your thoughts and i would you know i think the panel is unfolding in a very nice way and if subsequent panelists can build on also some of the conversations from the earlier ones that would be really nice uh so sorry i have to also introduce sangeeta i introduce sneha uh, so the full bio will come there but sangeeta leads fundraising and donor partnerships at sneha she's been there for 2 years and before that she has a lot of experience uh, working with corporates like cadbury and accenture but also what is nice is that she runs a bookstore and a storytelling festival for children uh, so over to you sangeeta thank you thank you nirima ji for that introduction and uh, great to be here as uh, part of this panel um uh, i know kirti ji uh, really set the context in terms of uh, several of the challenges uh, pertaining to urbanization uh, so while i won't go into that i'll look at it uh, specifically from the health perspective uh, which is what sneha works on uh, and then go on to you know how uh, csr and philanthropy can uh, support civil society organizations <coughs> sorry uh so in terms of a uh, um a health perspective and you know primarily the mumbai metropolitan region where sneha works uh, as has been you know shared earlier uh, almost 40% of the population of the uh, greater mumbai region lives in uh, urban and formal settlements and uh, within this migration is about 30% uh so really within this vulnerable population you know we have another uh, kind of uh, even more marginalized uh, population that is moving in and out of these settlements and uh, one of their major challenges is access to affordable uh, health services uh, and just to give you uh, an example of one of the uh, locations where we work which is bivandi uh, which is a suburb of uh, uh, mumbai uh, the official population as per the census uh, is 8 lakhs 
the unofficial figures, you know, in our conversations with, um, you know, systems there, etc., is that there is a floating population of nine lakhs. Uh, so Bivandi essentially is uh, has a, a power loom industry. It's a warehousing hub. Uh, so really, there's this population of nine lakhs, which are essentially migrants uh, from other states uh, in India, uh, primarily UP and Bihar. Um, and uh, if you look at the urban resource planning done by the um, uh, corporation, it's done keeping in mind the official figure of eight lakhs. So you know where does this floating population really go, and what are the resources uh, available to them? And even health infrastructure wise, Vivandi has just uh, 15 health posts for a very large uh, geographical area that it covers. Uh, there are no maternity homes, there's only one, um, uh, you know, a higher level health facility, uh, no 24 by 7 obstetric services. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, pregnant women have to travel very far if it is a high risk case and they need to, um, you know, uh, deliver other than a regular um, normal delivery. Uh, so this again leads to several health complications. Uh, one, there's a higher incidence of home deliveries that happen here. So about 30% home deliveries, which is much higher than the rest of the uh, Mumbai region. Uh, so therefore, you know, posing a higher risk to uh, mothers and babies here. Um, another challenge which we've seen uh, and which has really come to the forefront during the pandemic is two issues uh, that come to mind. One is the rising cases of violence against women and children. Uh, which a lot of you may have read about, especially when, you know, there was the complete lockdown. Uh, and second is the mental health aspect, which is again an emerging uh, issue. Uh, I think not just because of the COVID pandemic, but even before that, we had seen this as a very critical health issue, especially among the adolescent uh, population. So the 10 to uh, 19 age group. Uh, and these two areas specifically, the ones I mentioned, the gender-based violence and um, mental health, uh, looking at, you know, a support from CSR, uh, especially, this is not an area that CSR maybe is very comfortable to fund. Uh, so maybe health and nutrition is something that, um, uh, you know, is easier to understand and uh, track in terms of uh, improvements in uh, indicators of health and nutrition, uh, whereas uh, uh, the violence issue as well as mental health is, you know, not something that CSR generally funds. Um, in terms of looking at how civil society groups can respond to these challenges, um, and I really resonate with you know, what Srikant had to say on this, uh, in terms of looking at it from the community perspective. Uh, and what we try and do as well is really take the community um, uh, you know, in partnership wherever we work. So really uh, share with them, um, uh, it, in, sorry, in terms of take feedback from them in terms of what they require and then work you know, keeping that in mind, keeping the community um, in the forefront. And one of the things we've tried to do is really uh, create these community volunteer groups. Uh, so groups of men and women who, you know, want to take uh, initiative for the community. Uh, we train them. And what has been interesting is while, uh, you know, Sneha being a health NGO, we train them on, say, maternal health, child health, nutrition, etc. What we've seen is that these groups actually end up taking action on whatever is really their concerns. Uh, so, for example, wash, uh, it could be, you know, garbage collection. Uh, during the COVID pandemic specifically, we saw uh, one, they really were able to advocate with the systems authorities for, say, regular cleaning of toilets. Uh, they also supported a lot of the relief work uh, that happened in the communities. Uh, so, you know, while uh, uh, the pandemic obviously had a, uh, you know, terrible impact in terms of, say, livelihood for them or even the food security in these communities, uh, one bright light for us was how these community volunteer groups were able to really stand up and take action uh, on their own, even if we were not, uh, you know, on the ground with them uh, during those lockdown months. Um, so, and, and another important thing we've seen is really, uh, again, as Srikant was saying, linking the community with the systems is uh, what has been critical. Uh, and really, you know, eventually for uh, all us NGOs to really take a step back and say the communities and the government uh, systems is what needs to work together. Uh, so that's, again, something that uh, we focused on. Um, just to give you an example in terms of, um, uh, you know, where um, civil society groups can uh, make a difference also. Uh, and what we look at is in terms of how can we really create these models that work. Uh, and I'd like to give an example here. So some of the uh, uh, government policies, if you look at them, uh, the policies are very well written out. So for example, in the area of adolescent health that we work, we have the uh, RKSK scheme, which is Rashtriya Kishore Swastya Karyakram. 
Uh, and if you see the policies, they are very well detailed out and uh, they talk about adolescent friendly health clinics, which are supposed to be there in all the health posts. Uh, but these exist on paper. They are not, uh, at least in urban areas, we don't see these adolescent uh, uh, clinics that run. Uh, what we are trying to do is pilot, uh, at least in two municipal corporations, these uh, adolescent friendly health clinics. And really looking at, you know, then creating that model, which the government can then take on. So really where we see the role of the government coming in, uh, in this, as well as, you know, other work that uh, civil society organizations do is taking on those models, scaling it up across regions, you know, looking at the infrastructure needs, etc. Where corporates and, uh, you know, CSR philanthropists come in, which is really the focus of the discussion today. One, of course, is the financial resources, which, you know, um, uh, which is kind of what we all talk about in terms of supporting um, uh, this kind of work. But again, looking at it from a long-term investment, uh, you know, as I think the prior speaker said, this is not short-term work that we're doing. There are so many underlying social problems that cannot be solved overnight or in a year or two even. Uh, so really, you know, we need CSR to partner with civil society groups for, the, for a longer term, understand uh, I think the challenges on ground and then see, you know, how they can um, uh, continue to support such work. Uh, another area is in terms of, uh, say, piloting new initiatives. And uh, Nirimaji, you spoke about, uh, you know, unrestricted funding that, um, uh, uh, you know, that we have received or, you know, other organizations may have. And this is where we feel, you know, we can use this to um, look at any technology solutions or digital solutions, which may not otherwise get funded by CSR. Uh, so one of the things we're piloting at, and this is very nascent, uh, which we started um, just a month ago, is in terms of looking at e-referral systems, where we're trying to link community volunteer groups uh, to the public health system so that they can track referrals that are made by these community volunteer groups. Uh, and this is, in fact, being supported by uh, an HNI through Dasra. And it's very interesting, and I gave this example because uh, we do have approval from two municipal corporations to work on this. So we have a civil society organization, we have uh, the public health system, we have a technology partner who we've uh, tied up with who will actually come up with a digital solution. And then we have you know, a funder who's supporting this. Uh, so really each one you know, bring to the table their expertise um, uh, on this. Uh, another area where uh, CSR can support really is in terms of uh, the skills and expertise they can build uh, in terms of looking at organization capacity building. Uh, so, you know, there is some expertise that civil society organizations bring, which is really in terms of the on ground work that we do. But yes, there is scope for us to, uh, you know, improve in terms of uh, whether it's managerial skills, leadership development, financial uh, processes, technology, etc. And this is where, you know, CSR can look at uh, discretionary uh, or unrestricted funding to support, um, uh, you know, organizations on this. Uh, another area which hasn't been, I think, too much explored, um, at least in India, is shared services uh, for civil society organizations. So while this is common in the corporate sector where you have shared services for uh, IT, payroll, etc., uh, but uh, the nonprofit sector could, you know, possibly benefit from something like this, where uh, IT expertise or HR payroll, et cetera, could be done by a common shared services center. The challenge, of course, is, you know, who would fund such a center? So maybe if there is a philanthropic organization that uh, is looking at really uh, benefiting the whole ecosystem of these civil society organizations, uh, at least in terms of setting up, and then, you know, there could be, uh, uh, the shared services could actually provide this at subsidized rates to uh, civil society organizations. Um, also, we are talking about, you know, uh, uh, civil society uh, seeking support from CSR and philanthropy and uh, uh, how do they do this. So this is uh, maybe not a term which is associated uh, too much with uh, nonprofits. Uh, but in a way, uh, looking at, you know, uh, uh, the changing times, maybe it's, it's the time to look at innovatively maybe marketing uh, civil society organizations. Uh, and I'm not saying this from a commercial or an advertising sense, but more in terms of building awareness of some of these critical urban issues that we're talking about uh, with CSR and with corporates, um, whether it's you know health, education, livelihood, et cetera, and then trying to uh, maybe share or explain what are some of the underlying causes for this and you know why CSR needs to be in it for the long haul. <laughs> so really communicating clearly the need for support, maybe looking at, uh, you know, a few NGOs even coming together to champion a particular cause. Uh, so during the lockdown, uh, there was actually a creative agency that uh, ran a pro bono uh, online campaign on um, uh, the issue of violence against women. And, you know, this helped raise funds in a very short span of time. 
uh, for our program on gender based violence so it really made us think you know is is that something that would work so for example uh, would it help to have a film on the issue of malnutrition in urban slums uh you know just to uh, uh, really put that cause into focus uh you know one shouldn't really wait for a pandemic to happen for you know csr or philanthropy to come forward and support so how do we really uh, you know showcase that some of these critical urban issues uh, need that kind of uh, support that you know uh, covid relief uh, saw very quickly happening uh and also i think just to close the loop uh in terms of also communicating communicating back to csr and philanthropists the impact that happens on the ground uh so you know not just in terms of indicators but also sharing success stories of people from the ground voices from the ground is something uh i think we can try and do better um uh, and and last of all uh, there is a lot of talk which happens on volunteering and employee engagement uh, i think my only caution here is <coughs> sorry a a one day or a one time volunteering effort or employee engagement uh, does not really help the cause i think only if it's a longer term volunteering whether it's you know 2 3 months or even longer uh, an organization say a corporate that really works with the organization understands you know the needs um so we've had organizations uh, help us put our financial processes into place have worked with us on you know an it audit Uh, a risk audit, etc. But these have all been longer-term volunteering assignments. So I think you know this works better than one-off uh, kind of employee engagements um, that happen. Um, so yeah, really. So those are my the thoughts I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sangeeta. Thank you. Uh, very very concrete and nice. Just on that last bit that you said about employee volunteerism, I would urge you to begin to look at voluntary employee volunteering not as they contributing to you. but as you contributing to them in terms of sensitizing them and making them understand this world a little bit more definitely um, yeah. thank you very much sangeeta and uh, i am now very happy to call on amitabh uh, he has of course again his full bio will appear he is the chief executive of oxfam india but more than that i think amitabh has spent his life just kind of standing for and working for people centric ideas development institutions everything um so thank you very much amitabh for taking out the time and over to you please so thank you neelima and thank you kirti ji for inviting me this is a, a fascinating conversation and uh, i i must say let me start with two things one kirti ji your slide on what civil society could do is a slide which in many ways captures uh the possible areas that uh, one could imagine and shrikant i completely agree pretty much echo with every word that you said uh so thank you for for raising those tough questions uh, that you have raised so let, let me just start by saying uh that i i'm delighted that we are talking about this because this is this is not a formulation i'm in a conference seminar pretty much every day uh speaking to different kinds of issues but this formulation of how the csr philanthropy could strengthen the urban agenda is i have not uh, come across this it's it's an interesting way of looking at it it sharply focuses our attention on what is lacking so thank you for for doing it i don't know how much we'll be able to push the agenda but but glad that you're asking at least that that uh, question because it does help us uh, to think and in terms of also uh, as nilima you started last year was you know the heart wrenching scenes that we saw of migration uh completely heartbreaking uh people walking thousands of kilometers bare feet no water no food but essentially the problem was in the cities which which was so inhospitable to them the day the lockdown happened within a few days they were actually evicted from their own homes that that's what the cities were and and we saw that ugly face of how we have organized our cities how we have organized our urban spaces so it's good that we are talking about it and i i think you know uh, maybe i'm i'm saying it harshly but we need to acknowledge how insensitive our cities have been to the poorest of the poor of this country who come and actually build those cities uh 
so so you know that and and then i would also want to say this this is uh, so many layers so kirti ji's parts of your presentation did talk about it but uh, we were talking about mumbai every time i go to mumbai and from the mumbai airport when i end up going to the fort i see that the uh, that 27 floor building which is architecturally also not beautiful uh, and and supposed to be the most expensive house uh, for a long long time and you just see all around that uh, uh, the the number of people who must be living in just a square kilometer around that in the informal settlements the jogi bastis so the level of inequality in the cities is also stark and obscene uh, and it is constantly consistently growing that that's something also i wanted to put front and center i was uh, coming uh, you know from marathwada cup few years ago after a drought and and i reached pune and i was driving from pune to mumbai and that's the time when i spoke to sainath and sainath said oh please don't sleep while you're driving uh, just look at the billboards and i started doing that and there were billboards and i was coming from marathwada uh, from a drought hit area and the billboards were selling flats uh, in mumbai with a swimming pool in each flat uh coming straight from that drought prone to area to to looking at those those so that's that's the you know imagination of of also the cities uh that we have so i just you know just wanted to bring that up because cities obviously mean multiple things to multiple people there's no one narrative of of cities cities are also the site of sectarian politics of hatred that we are seeing which is growing enormously at, at the moment but on the other hand cities are also the sites of protest and of dissent so it, it's really you know all those that we need to look at and i just wanted to bring that together uh, to start looking at the question that that uh, uh, we have about what does the civil uh, society do how can csr and and uh, philanthropy strengthen this this work but let me also just say one more thing and the point that i think has already been made but i do think that that when we say urban spaces we end up thinking of large cities uh but but we do know that urban is not just delhi mumbai and it is not even bhopal indore it is those smaller towns between bhopal and indore or between uh, uh mumbai and nagpur and so on so so we we need to look at that and then the peri urban areas which are also very very critical so uh, that that's also critical but they have their own uh, uh different stories but having said this <clears throat> let me just now move to the, the the critical question we have and in that what i would say is that we need to start looking at you know I, i'm very tempted to go srikant's way uh and, and talk about some of the fundamental pieces but because srikant you've done that and you've done it really well uh, uh i'll try and move the needle slightly ahead uh so let me first start by saying what is civil society's role in any developmental architecture in a democratic architecture i think that's that's also critical and i see three or four pieces the first piece would not have been part of my understanding earlier uh, you know I, I, it's evolved over the years is of service delivery i i i know that many of my own friends will say that uh, where the service delivery come in from but but like what we saw during covid or or we've seen moments of serious desperation in that if you don't do service delivery we'll not be able to move ahead but that should be within the framework of the second and third the second is i think holding power to account and and that is in in srikant's word it's about democracy it's about civic participation it's it's uh, popular control over power uh, that's that's the essence of democracy and that's the second role of civil society how do you do that how do you work with communities in holding power account and i think that's a very very critical role and that's a piece we often miss 
and Neelima, the report that you were talking of, you and I have talked about it. We all feel that that's an area from where there's a, uh, there's a complete withdrawal of support. Whereas we think that given the resources with the Indian state becomes bigger, that's the area where we need to invest much more. And the third is the idea of, of uh, innovations. And I completely take what Srikanth is saying. This, this whole uh, desire to innovate, almost create new fashions uh, every second year is not what I'm talking of, but, but new ideas do come from civil society and from the margins. As in, just, just look at joint forest management. Uh, it did come from civil society. Barefoot doctors came from civil society, but it did not obviously happen in three months or in a project cycle of three years. It was a long drawn work of probably few of them for, for decades, which then gradually uh, uh, became more, more mainstream. So if these are the three ideas, how are the CSRs and philanthropies responding to it? That's, that's the question that I would ask. <clears throat> and I would say that the, the picture is very, very bleak. At this moment, you know, I would really say that before we ask this question, we need to actually say that how do we build the urban narrative of development? I think we also, we've been wanting in terms of adequately building in the development world, uh, a narrative on, of the urban spaces. So, you know, groups like Janagra are very few, uh, very, very few given the urban uh, uh, landscape we have in this country. Uh, I work very closely with UI in Mumbai, but, but these are very few groups uh, that you will see. In Delhi, if you ask about groups, I will not know of many groups which work on urban issues. Many groups are based here, but work on uh, siloized ways of, of looking at, at things. So. The first task, I think, even before we are reaching the CSRs and philanthropies, is to actually uh, build an urban narrative. So maybe this is part of that conversation, but the building of urban narrative it has to be done by design in the developmental schools, in media, etc. How how do we create that? It will be a lot of thinking, intentional thinking, but it's needed if we actually need to go there. Second is then philanthropy, and I completely agree, uh, uh, Nilima, that we just cannot merge the philanthropies and CSRs. Uh, they, they are two very different animals, and we need to understand the two uh, uh, where, from where they're coming from. But from for philanthropies, uh, you know, without becoming critical. So again, let me just re-emphasize every bit Srikant said, I agree with it. So I'm just now looking at what are the possible solutions? There are very few philanthropists in this country, but there are few progressive ones. So can we look at building the field as donors say of the urban space? I used to work 20 years ago in, in um, uh, the Ford Foundation. And then I remember we would actually talk of building the, the field. And Srikant, you would probably remember that's the time we were as Ford Foundation strengthening local governments, both urban and rural. And we were just as Ford then seeding different kinds of ideas, being very agnostic about which will work, but actually looking at people who had ideas and trying to support them. So that's, that's the building the field. I think philanthropies need to do that particularly Indian philanthropies, and they've not done that. And I don't see why they cannot do in the urban space. This is not a contentious amnesty kind of piece uh, that they would be scared of, of, of working on. So, so that's one. Uh, the second is then building institutions. Uh, it is very, very critical that civil society groups, which can both build on, on, on these narratives, try and build, uh, do experiments, etc are given the core support that's critical. But I don't think at this moment we have a critical. My understanding as in for the last few years, I've not engaged much with uh, uh, the, the urban landscape of, of Indian civil society, but it is actually uh, more uh, inhabited by now the consulting firms, uh, which are not necessarily in the business of what civil society does. So nurturing institutions 
is going to be critical without uh, without really uh, uh, seeking specific uh, ideas of, of 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 delivery and on the other hand csr you know the one of the questions that you asked nilima was what can they do i i let me start by saying i'm you know the first thing is do no harm csrs we need to really go back as in there's a massive problem in terms of the way industries are organized in this country. Uh, I hope Anant will later talk about it, as in I was very inspired by the initiative Anant is, is leading, uh, where it is in some ways an acknowledgement by the captains of this industry after COVID, which was pretty much an X-ray, that how we have not been able to put our house uh, in, in, in the right order. So, and, and it starts from the habitat of the, the people who work with you to the social security, uh, to the wages, et cetera. So it's, it's a multi-layered piece, which just the, the CSRs, their companies can actually do. And it has to run through the supply chain. It can't be within the walls of the industry that this is my job and, and what happens in the supply chain is not my responsibility. I think if CSRs, you know, in a way, not CSRs, but their parent companies who are doing CSRs, if they could just do this, I think it would be uh, uh, quite remarkable. If this, they're still keen to do something worthwhile, it could be. You know, what I would say is that we'll need to get out of uh, just doing regeneration of lakes and doing uh, hospitals, eye camps. That's something which is. Um, which is good, but the fundamental point is, uh, there are several pieces which can look at the structural causes of whether it's poverty, lack of development, discrimination, inequality. And CSRs, if they're willing, they can still identify, while I understand their limitation, they can still identify tangible pieces to be supported. And, and you know, the, so, uh, uh, a lake regeneration, is it lake regeneration or is it about civic participation? That's, that's the fundamental question that we need to ask. Uh, if it is about civic regeneration, uh, so civic participation, then it's something worth doing. But that's the, uh, the way of, of, of looking at things if you're gonna uh, look at the urban question. But finally, I, you know, I would just say, uh, let me end that these are deeply divided uh, times and, uh, and a, a contextual uh, investments are not going to be helpful. So how are the urban spaces developing? Why is uh, uh, communalism on the rise? If they're, they're not getting into some of these fundamental questions, I doubt we'll be able to create uh, the, the, the urban space that Kirti Shahji was talking about. You know, it, it, it sounded like a fantastic phrase, Kirti Ji, the last line that you talked of, the inclusive, democratic uh, uh, cities. But we are very far from it. And there's much thinking about it, about how even, you know, ultimately, uh, and, and to just let me end with, you know, reinforcing Srikant's point, that we are part of a system and you cannot zoom in to one specific problem, which CSRs often do, and most of the philanthropies do, and you expect that you will get solutions. It's a systemic intervention that we'll need to design and think through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amitabh. And uh, I just want to kind of underline two things that you said. Uh, one, I think, maybe not very central to this conversation, but I know both you and Shikan touched upon it, which was the role of civil society. And, uh, and I just want to add, Amitabh, to what you said, and Shikan put it differently about, you know, being agents of change and principles of change, and you separated between the two. And I maybe just want to add to that uh, conversation about role that somehow I feel we should not look at this agent of change or the roles that you spoke about, Amitabh, as though it is an agent who itself doesn't need to change. In this case, we are talking about agents who themselves have to become part of the change process because 
and therefore they are not separate from society and and saying that these are the and that's what sometimes create that uh, uh, rebound that you know uh, non profits seem to have a taken a moral high ground and said we know what needs to be done and we will tell either the community or the state about the solution so so that was just one i know that's on a tangent but i think the other that you said amitabh so beautifully you spoke about things that need to be done and all of them are hard i tell you and you know that uh, amitabh as well you know whether you talk about building the field right you said it so well so well or building institutions that's something that no one's even now it's totally unfashionable amitabh amitabh you've gone become old so have i and we are talking of things which uh, but uh, you were talking about taking a systems perspective and i like that word so much about a contextual investments will not i couldn't agree more and but we have to find a way i think to push the conversation towards the side of beginning to look beyond like the gada they say in hindi when the bullock just walks in a way because it's used to walking on that way the wheels just follow so we have to get out of that and we have to begin to take a larger perspective for the investments actually of csr to yield true results so thank you thank you very much so anand um, over to you uh, and anand is uh, he's uh, he's the director capacity building for non profits and systems at dasra in uh, all the conversation was coming your way anand uh, but also i think dasra has been doing uh, some very phenomenal work in putting the spotlight on the kinds of issues that we've been talking about of the field becoming narrow and sectarian these are be the kind of work that is needed uh, so over to you anand then thank you very much no oh, thank thank you so much and uh, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to shrikant and and sangeeta I and mean, I've worked in the past, and Amitabh, of course. I mean, it's it's like uh, it's hard to go after Messi, right? So, uh, and uh, whichever team you play for, but I, I think a few of these points are, you know, one hopes one sees some light of day, uh, like Kriti said, in one's lifetime, right? And if a lifetime is happened, then that is a very big thing. That is a big thing. So, uh, I say some of this with a huge pinch of salt, and. maybe with a degree of naivety maybe i'm coming across uh, also as a little bit of overly optimistic but uh, i think what is life without a little bit of that uh, optimism uh, as as i'll sort of share a few of these perspectives all of these are learned from the leaders who are speaking right now so i'm all i'm trying to do is maybe connect a few dots and uh, and play back why i still have some optimism uh, uh, because it's it's sometimes easy to get uh, um, overwhelmed by the size of the challenges which uh, exist in front of us uh, i i am going to uh, share a few slides very quickly and uh, you know uh, i hope you can see this nilima and okay uh, so this term you know i debated a lot with i should even use this term but there's actually a term which is called the wicket problem right and um you know uh, and, and when i google like what is a wicket problem it's a problem which is uh, you know difficult to solve because there are a few things uh, about a wicket problem which makes it wicked um uh, it, i was just resonating a lot with what amitabh and shrikant and uh, you know kirti uh, ji were sharing like there is usually contradictory knowledge about a wicket problem uh, and uh, you know it is truly contradictory which means on that same exact topic different stakeholders genuinely believe different things um and this is a great example corporates foundations activists civil society and and the government uh you know if i went and interviewed all five on the same exact issue it's quite likely they will come up with very different points of true knowledge and belief uh i think there are multiple stakeholders which is i think um, uh very very true uh there are usually economic burdens which are not uh which no one is willing to bear uh in the short term what i mean by that is for wicked problems to get solved someone actually has to cut a big check and that someone who is going to cut a big check most likely will not see the benefit of that big check in his or her lifetime uh again a classic definition of why this problem remains wicked 
uh, and 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 obviously uh, lots of what uh, we are talking about uh, need those kind of investments usually the governments will which will make those investments will not basically be able to claim victory uh, uh, as as we see and largely there are interdependencies and you know this is important for us to and, and in a way i think uh, whether csr or philanthropy uh, acknowledging that these are wicked problems uh, and unfortunately there is not enough academic um, discourse there is not enough thoughtful deliberation on why is a problem hard to solve uh, and, and many of us uh, face this on a daily basis um, uh, i also wanted to go back to what amitabh i think uh, you put very beautifully and uh, you know there's an interesting book i was reading and uh, I, i was shocked to my absolute core because you know the education system i have been a product of uh, has always talked about this concept of merit right and we talk of meritocracy and merit in a very good way and and, and that's fine but read the sentence right which says um, you know if i am responsible for having accrued some share of the worldly goods whether it's income a job wealth power prestige status i must deserve it success is a sign that it's a virtue my affluence is my due now the now what sounds like a very innocuous and maybe almost like a you know this has been the mainstay of how the middle class has um uh, labored hard and done well the problem with this statement the problem with this mindset which i think this book um and i'd really encourage people to see this book uh, or read a little bit of a snippet of that uh, it basically goes very much to the core of why um, it is always easy to justify why i did the right things for myself and hence i deserve what i got and discounts the fact that our genetic lottery is actually the reason why maybe 90% of what has happened uh, to me uh just to take an example i had the fortune of knowing uh someone who used to drive a car for me um uh, you know that person i i like i remember my conversations with him uh distinctly his ability to analyze a problem his ability to compare stuff his ability to decode a complex issue into its basics was better than many consultants i would have worked with at bain or wherever else but i think purely because of the genetic lottery the person did not get those opportunities and why am i making this point i'm making this point because unless we keep these issues front and center uh it's very easy for us to neglect the very foundations of why things are inequitable and not make the right kind of investments which are needed and continue to make superficial investments and superficial um uh, let's call it as uh, you know finishing school kind of uh, things uh and and that i think um, you know the reason i think shrikant you put it so well is it's almost like assuming that there is nothing happening below and assuming that we can keep operating on the surface um what does it mean you know and again uh, there is there is very real people who are making real changes like amitabh said i think maybe 10 to 15% of corporates and philanthropists are thinking differently so what i'm putting here is maybe um more a little bit about why things have to change uh but this still unfortunately still remains center of gravity right so um i think the first point has been spoken enough i mean it's shocking how much money is flowing through csr just to give you a sense if you take some of the larger csr givers uh you know at 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 uh, the mandated 2% and you know at at the mandated uh they will be giving 1000 crores per annum right 1000 crores per annum it's more than what the largest foundations give so we are in a situation thanks to a economy which is actually going to grow and some of the largest unicorns are going to go public uh, we will have real money flowing into this with a mindset which unfortunately is like i'd almost call it as a um, uh you know a mindset which is not uh, geared for that kind of money uh, so there is fragmentation there is program centricity uh there is a solo proprietary mindset which is look i want to see my name on the wall uh moment you want to see your name on the wall it's a lost battle because no one else is going to you know come and join you in that particular thing i think the third point i think uh, everyone mentioned is uh the short termism which is 
very very prevalent in the corporate world also uh, basically discounts commons discounts those infrastructural things you have to put in place because you usually will not live to see the benefits of the long term actions and lastly there is a uh, there is almost an unhealthy focus on a cost of cost efficiency mindset which is uh, you know tell me exactly what is the cost per beneficiary uh, if one can look at it and uh, i'll come in a minute to why that is very counterproductive to solving any of these issues uh, you know some of these issues keep us and the the picture on the right hand side is a fun story i heard from a professor a long time back he called it uh, and i'll just use the hindi term fata football which means a torn football you know the football is torn in many parts uh, in 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 hilarious fashion uh, he tried to pump air into it and he was a very you know like demonstrative kind of a guy and the football doesn't inflate so the question someone posted on chat is why don't we start seeing benefits you know it's the same fata football theory if you have 10 problems with that football if you don't actually plug those leaks and then start pumping in properly and not just pumping in five pumps and then you want to see results but you go the whole distance uh, one will constantly remain in this fata football kind of a mindset and then uh, and, and then in a way we'll we'll not see the true results um, taking a quick example of and again i think making it real is useful this is a problem of the challenge we saw with migrant right amitabh was mentioning and shrikant's obviously uh, many of us have seen this very close um you know we sort of while we were all shocked i think one of the things we were lucky is many business leaders actually and these were you know the the really you know parsi business families who said we want to do the right thing so i think it always needs someone to stand up and say we want to do the right thing but what it started doing was getting a set of business owners to start saying if we do not treat our informal workers with respect then we are not a responsible business and we are not a sustainable business so in a in a way it it moved away from charity it moved away from the superficial and it confronted and and in a way what was very interesting and again these are handful of companies so these are not by no means like hundreds of them they not only got this done they got this presented in a undiluted fashion to their business board uh, that's a big deal a company going and letting its board know what is going on with its practices with uh, you know its its workforce uh truly means business um what was interesting also was um it was cl clear that there are some outcomes which have to be done and uh, like shrikant said i think these are outcomes keeping the informal worker in mind uh just to give you a sense uh, there's a big debate on what is the minimum wage and right now we are at 178 rupees per day uh there was a long debate to get it up from 176 rupees as <laughs> would obviously have championed that in usa right now 8 dollars an hour is basically the number now even if you apply the most liberal purchasing power parity you're talking about 64 dollars a day and 2 dollars a day and by the way the 2 dollars a day does not come to many people so in in a, in a way i think it also then starts making it clear why outcomes are so critical and outcomes defined as a uh, as the as the person will actually experience it and not outcomes defined as a philanthropist or a ngo will see it and uh, and what was interesting is given that focus uh, actually businesses and uh, you know you see some of the stuff happening in chakan and area around pune and uh, this is largely driven by two business groups thermax and forbes marshall and now uh, you know others are also joining that but what is pretty interesting you can see some of the names around that tata daimler but what's interesting is they have come together to take concrete actions but which is rooted not in tokenism because we have to keep tokenistic actions out otherwise we will again lose the battle simply because we'll do a bunch of stuff but 10 years later we'll figure out saying that you know nothing has actually changed uh, but the reason i'm sharing this is while it's very early days and there are obviously many many such things going on in india it's actually possible to start making a change just to end with i think the four learnings we have had uh, in this others and many of these are through conversations with uh, you know cop, uh, civil society leaders i think the first is we have to have to put user centricity and user defined metrics at the center we don't have time for program metrics only we absolutely don't have time for meandering collaboratives uh, 
uh, you know, meandering collaboratives, while they are great conversations, they are all uh, intellectual, like upper middle class conversations. They don't cut through to what actually matters to the actual users. I'm deliberately not using the term beneficiaries. They are users. I think the second one is we got to put in the fuel. You know, some of the calculations we had done for any wicked issue at any city, you need to earmark $100 million. Uh, so you need multi-stakeholder scale vehicles. You cannot afford for a rocket to not have be fully fueled and expect it to break through uh, gravity. So, uh, you know, we'll have to find that money. I think the long-term investments in urban commons is very critical. She can't mention capacity building of the ULBs. It's an urban common. And uh, unless that is in uh, place, nothing which is done will actually sustain. But that investment will never be visible. That investment will never give that gratification of I saw a midday meal come through. But someone has to pay for that. Otherwise, we will not see the results. Uh, and of course, lastly, like someone said, CSR cannot be about going and painting walls. There are skills that a corporate is good at. Capital is one such skill. But there are competencies a corporate is good at. Can the corporates not take those and bring capital and competency together, but moving away from a Jugaad mindset, almost moving away from a small scale industry mindset to actually doing what it takes to solve some of these wicked issues. So with that, um, I'll pause, but uh, thank you so much uh, for, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anand. And that last slide was really a, a wonderful kind of summary of um, uh, uh, of speaking to the next two speakers about you know where we are and where we need to go and maybe the next two speakers can now talk about how we can possibly reach that tomorrow which you described is where we ought to be uh, but thank you very much uh, and, and that was very very useful uh, so may i now invite rohit uh, rohit uh, leads csr and affirmative action at tata motors and uh, he, not only, uh, Rohit, you are representing one of the finest companies in the country and you are also uh, representing their CSR. So I'm sure a lot of expectations, we're all waiting to hear from you about uh, your reflections on what you've heard till now and how like the original agenda as KTG had proposed, how could CSR and philanthropies contribute more to solving the urban problem? Uh, thank you very much, Rohit. Uh, thank you and good evening to all of you. Am I audible? Thank you. Thank yes, you for you confirming. Are. So, after hearing uh, some of the finest minds um, on, on a subject which is so complex, which is so systemic, I really do not have much to add, frankly speaking because I a, completely concur with what they are saying. I completely endorse the pathways that they have laid forward. So, but one thing where I could have a disagreement of this entire discussion is the conjecture on which the discussion has been put. That is supporting and strengthening civil society in addressing the urban challenge. How can CSR help? So the word CSR and narrowing it to just CSR is a wrong conjecture in the first place. What I will do is I will not repeat what my uh, colleagues have said. I will just uh, uh, highlight some of the perspectives that I have. And I will, I will come from an ecological uh, perspective, put in a bit of Chicago school of thought and then come out as to how we can work together to, to address this very complex problem. So we know cities are cities have surpassed their threshold as there is an acute anomaly as far as the demand and supply is concerned. And this has given rise to what we generally call the urban blight. Now the urban blight is not just physical in nature, but is also the social in nature. And that's what, and this leads to sharing of power, sharing of resources, uh, formation of um, uh, social equities and where a certain community uh, live. And the Chicago School of Thought says that, yeah, there is a ghettoization and there are certain nuances where there's a push and pull and there's a negotiation. 
one of the another aspects of this uh, social uh, this urban blight in terms of uh, uh, society is concerned you know the relationship between the the citizens has got strained because of this very reason that there is a shortage of resource and instead of collaborative relationship today we are confrontationist so middle class does not stand up for the people who 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 have very lean economic models when was the last time we heard that the middle class came up came to the roads to support any law that is in their favor day and day in and day out our the poorest of the poor are getting disenfranchised and just let, let me just put this in context during this covid times the government came up with relaxation of labor laws when did the middle class talk about it the nrc and caa which is going to disenfranchise so many people when did the middle class come and talk about it and let me put this in another context so we wanted to understand uh, what are these complexities that come up and in 2009 we at tata motors we conducted something called community perception study which in a way tried to assess and gauge what are the externalities that tata motors has created in its vicinity hearing it from layers of people right from shop owners to sit middle class to citizens to to hawkers to people living in slum everyone and very interestingly the kind of uh, expectations the aspirations that came up were a not just conflicting but contradictory and uh, depending on who's he's who situated where in the social and economic hierarchy we were not able to see say what what are these where do we find the sweet balance because one said that uh, you are contributing to the traffic problem so why don't you pick up your industry and go find a place elsewhere then what about the hawkers and what about the ancillaries who find job there so a sweet balance was something which was not another element which came up was citizens are uh wanting corporates to take certain civic roles that is something that is supposed to be done by the government they are expecting uh corporates to take on those roles and very rightly so because in this entire sharing of resources if as it is said mentioned if cities are guzzlers within the city it is these industrial houses who are guzzlers of resources but whether it is water land electricity and rightfully uh, citizens have all the right to ask that it's not just the government but it's the corporate who need to come forward and shell out some more money but this is where the discomfort comes from where why because a we may see that 2% uh, you know allocation is a lot of money but frankly corporates don't have the wherewithal to address these issues you know it is it will be very arrogant on to the corporates to say that yes uh, we have the resources to address it no we don't have the resources we don't have the bandwidth to address these challenges challenges therefore whatever is the percent on percent growth year on year with respect to funds available for csr is going to be highly highly inadequate and and therefore uh, you know someone who thinks that you know, there's a lot of resource i believe we are knocking the uh, wrong door whereas um, one can possibly look at including uh, you know sitting across the table all the all the stakeholders uh, and see how urban planning can be done better civil society organizations need to show corporates that a there is an enlightened self interest to share resources because it is going to address systemic problems it's not just the profit it's the people when i say people is the human rights and the planet when it comes to our environmental responsibilities so are you ensuring that you are not just giving minimum wages but you are also developing on the various layers of uh, human rights and uh, 
our friends have very rightly said it should not be just within the fence you have to look at the entire value chain in order to address these things and therefore uh, it's high time that uh, uh, state actors civil society citizens they sit and devise a perspective plan if they really wish to address this challenge second is where one needs to work is that all the all the problems are not just in the cities as as amitabh mentioned there are transit towns as well so if you can if if government wants csr to work in areas or corporate it, it wants corporates to work in so urban spaces or rural spaces what about these transit towns because this is where you know people from say aspirational districts come they have a stop gap arrangement and there is a step migration that takes place why can't people work in these spaces and ensure that uh, you know certain entitlements that can be approved to them by just having their basic documents in place so that once they move from rural area come to these transit towns and when they enter the space, urban spaces more urban spaces there is a continuity of their entitlements and supporting uh, documents that would ensure and corporates are started have started looking at this so that's that's another area where you know many people would like to work i completely agree that uh, it's not just uh, it's not just dueling out of money that is going to solve the problem institutions which are working they need to be strengthened and they need so tata trust at one point in time was was you know providing resources to build institutions but there has been a shift in the entire understanding of why these institution maybe because a there are very few institutions that are working in this space in terms of advocacy policy rather you know and second is civil society itself is not you know united they have they, they too have a very different kind of a thought process which in a way dissipates energy so can there be a, a, a you know a formal body that unites civil society so just like you know you have various lobby houses you have various con confederations that engage with the government puts the um, uh, resource uh, puts the resource sharing model in place can't civil society uh, be one single unity and come forward and seek for resources otherwise uh, we will have the boston consulting groups we will have kpmg who will come and be be consultants to the government and may not may not even give the right kind of a nuanced understanding uh, with respect to policy formulation and implementation so these are some of the things which uh, we need to work i think uh, as far as uh, looking at funds are concerned i think uh, that's not the right place to uh, look at uh, we are missing the forest for the you know trees uh, look at corporate as an entity and not just csr uh, there are material issues which uh, there are strategic issues which corporate needs to um address with respect to their business sustainability and uh, civil society citizens play a very important role we really think need a body of research that tells the corporate that look this is how we are cross subsidizing what you are doing you know private profits at public risk at public cost cannot be the story times to come we have to have a very solid study that in a way should uh, tell the corporates that look we are we are adding value to what you are doing maybe you are not seeing it and sit across with the board members take a far more uh, uh, far more organic approach in terms of addressing uh, urban issues let and let us always be constantly reminded that we are a mixed economy and uh, we are we have adopted a socialist democracy we, and it's it is these uh principles that we should always keep in mind so that today if corporates want to be a neighbor of choice we should also have a government that endorses uh that yes it is accountable for the aspirations of the people and i see i definitely see corporates playing a very big role in contravancing the human rights perspective 
and uh, because if today i say let me just take an example if i say that i want to sell a vehicle which is human rights compliant and which is environmentally sensitive but it is going to come at a cost then i do not know how many people are going to buy my vehicle right so with that i will i will uh, give a cost to what i had to add only humble request is just don't look at uh 2% csr uh the resources are far far bigger available with corporates is just that we need to make them see an enlightened self interest in what we are doing thank you so much thank you so much rohit uh, you made some several very interesting points and i just want to say one or two from what you said i think one fundamental point that you made repeatedly is that instead of just looking at the 2% that corporates bring under csr there is need for a larger conversation about how that 2%, 2% is made you know now the conversation has shifted to how the profits are spent but the conversation earlier was about how the profit is made you know and which is what you are talking about that that's and and you also made a very interesting point that if actually we begin to work in the way in which we, we begin to produce products which are environmentally sustainable human rights conscious etc will the middle class will society bear the cost of of those and and it's it's a, a very interesting points and of course you also rohit spoke about you know the amount of money so csr mean so i there are many things that i want to pull out but just on this i'll say maybe rohit the conversation is not about that this money is small and therefore how much can you do around it and you should but it's about whatever whether the money is less or more in what is the manner in which it is to be spent huh? um, and and what is the so manner meaning uh, what you heard that increasingly the trend seems to be that it's become about a small part of the whole it's become about uh, short term and not long term it's become about like you said not projects and not uh, it's become about projects and not institutions etc so it's i i'm just grateful to you rohit for opening up so many things in your in your comments so thank you very much rohit and i hope we can come back to it uh so i so, so, so before yes, before yes. we go i just want to make a clarification i'm not at all uh, writing of that 2% thing all i'm saying is this 2% is so little that the municipal corporation of uh, say pcmc would have far more bigger budget yeah, yeah. i agree so, with you i completely agree with you on that rohit no uh, i know shrikant is wanting to come in but shrikant if i can request you to hold your horses please and uh, thank you and you will come back into the conversation so zena we kept the best for the last so zenab uh, can i just request you to please come in and uh, zenab is uh, looking at csr at eaton india foundation eaton one of the leading power companies uh, so over to you zenab uh, she's the youngest and the best and we saved her for the last and uh, yes uh, so thank you nadima ji and um, yeah i i mean i kind of Uh, i might sound inexperienced and i would also sound naive in this forum um given that i am as old as csr so um i i mean i'm also coming from the development sector i think i i do have a greater appreciation of uh, some of the challenges that the sector face some of the challenges that institutions in the sector face and how organizations find it difficult to raise money and raise money for things which are very very crucial and then moving into csr and when i talk about eaton's csr or companies like eaton uh the csr really started when the um, uh, or or csr really became stronger and broader and deeper when the csr act of 2013 came into being okay so it was not something which was like an organic choice for the company saying that now i'm going to move into doing more for the community it is something that was mandated by the government and that by for doing it. so um okay it's a, i think the point that i'm trying to make here or moving towards is that it was mandated on the company company didn't opt for doing it so it hasn't even thought through what kind of resources would go into running a efficient effective csr program uh, many companies are still all, 
thinking about that and trying to frame that uh, it it's it's not like uh, the civil society was framing this uh, this the, this new entity that was coming into the development eco ecosystem um so it, this entity just dropped in and then now it is trying to evolve itself over the next 6 7 years and i think there is a lot of investment that also needs to go into how this how the csr itself evolves and finds its own space and understand what the role that it needs to play i think no one really has a clear answer for that uh, as yet uh, one of the earlier speakers talked about how development sector leadership needs to come into corporate to be able to uh, guide csr better that hasn't happened either um, there there are um, I, I remember when I moved into CSR, and I'm, I'm drawing on a personal experience rather than theorizing many of many of the things that I would say. But um, I was cautioned on how you should not be doing corporate social irresponsibly. Um, so, and, and that sort of stayed with me because you know it's it's like the civil society will not accept you anymore because you have you have crossed the line and gone into that space of corporate world. At the same time, the corporate is not really taking the ownership of this baby, which was sort of forced on it, that you know, now you have to develop and take care of this and go ahead with it. So I sometimes feel very orphaned in this entire space. Like, who do I turn to when I have an issue and I want to talk? Uh, and CSR has many, many issues, you know. The CSR Act came into like CSR came into being in 2013. And now by 2021, we have had some major amendments. And some of the things that we just spoke about in terms of, you know, how we are only looking at programs, how we are looking at tangible benefits, how we are looking at things which are very short term. It's not an option again, right? Uh, the gov the uh, amendment defines it to be three years. So one has to find an answer in three years. Now, what is what do we, what does one do about that, right? It's, it's not about why you're not putting in um, energy into institutional building. There is no scope for institutional building in the seven, uh, in the schedule seven and the tenets that are put into them, right? So it's not very evident that even the law thought about it. Um, and some, and there are no players who are now informing the law to make it any better to be a support agency for the civil society and the development sector. Definitely, the company, the the uh, the many um, sort of conference, uh, you have these. Uh, forums where companies advocate about their own issues. They don't talk about these things either. Civil society has its own forums where they talk about civil society issues, but are they raising challenges that say whether a CSR would face in order to um, healthily support the civil society's growth? So I don't think we are, we are doing any of that. And then, you know, uh, sort of uh, saying that, you know, civil uh, CSR is short-term thinking, CSR lacks leadership, CSR lacks many other things that it lacks. It does. And completely agree with all of that. But I think one needs to take ownership of who the CSR really belongs to, to then nurture and let it grow and develop. Okay. So I come from that one. Uh, that's one thing that I wanted to talk about. Very quickly, the second thing I wanted to talk about is very close to what Rohit was saying about, you know, why are we just looking at a corporate in terms of CSR? The corporate needs to be looked at as an employer of many migrant workers who come to the city. Uh, the corporate needs to be looked at as, um, and not just unorganized sector workers, organized sector workers also. You have large HR teams which focus on how um, uh, these young uh, millennials who are coming into the organization are feeling included? Are we talking about how informal sector workers who are coming into your uh, factories feeling included? So there are many things that a corporate can do as a player, as somebody who is uh, who's the employer of, uh, of, of, of many people who come to the city and many migrant workers who come to the city. And I'm, I'm, I, it is sort of interesting what Anand talked about how you, know, you want to be uh, a fair employer, how you want to take the responsibility of people who are migrating to work in your premises and therefore taking care of them. That itself is a major, major um, uh, change. And I'm sort of, I mean, I've been following this particular initiative largely because I 
come with a uh, with with uh, a background of working with migrant workers and that's 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 what we are really calling out for uh, we've been calling out for um, for a long time right and interestingly um uh, one of the major issues within the urban spaces uh, which is to do with uh, I mean, which i feel is to do with the human component and the fact that there are such large migratory and floating population which are coming into cities um is to do with what kind of uh, uh, what kind of conditions do you provide for and an employer is the primary uh, link to a city and therefore an employer needs to be looked at in that space as well so one uh, i i a truly um uh, I, I, I agree with rohit that you know when you're looking at a corporate don't just look at csr but look at the corporate as a whole as an entity who's uh, a major player in uh, the urbanization landscape uh third thing that i wanted to bring to table and i wouldn't take much time because we're running short um is that of uh, perspective building um we we touched upon how there are volunteers who are coming into play how um um they and i i know sangeeta spoke about how you don't want short term volunteers um and uh, how long term volunteers are better placed or how corporate have certain skills which they can put to use when they are helping the civil society um but i'm coming from the development sector i was very very dismissive of volunteers saying that you know what can volunteers really do with civil with say a trained social work professional will not be doing in this space but i think what we can do here as um, employee engagement or volunteering or uh, is is perspective building we are building perspective of citizens as at large we are informing them of the issues that they see on the ground uh, as we see them on the ground so um that that's again somewhere where civil society can continue to play a larger role you know don't look as volunteers as a burden but as your inroads to changing mindsets changing people's perspectives building their perspectives because it's these very people who will go on to lead companies and at that point of time that will come handy because you know um informing your board takes a lot um and i think this is where we can start building and a uh, final list one point that i would repeat probably is csr is very young and nobody is really um, we not really nurturing it very well um and one needs to look at that uh, as well when we are talking about many things that csr is supposed to be doing for the civil society at large so i'll stop here nilima ji and i'll let more questions come in um uh, it's done thank you very much sanam did i say the best was coming in the end is very 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 nice enough and i agree with you that one needs to be a little more kind and understanding and give give this space time to to develop and evolve um so thank you uh, zena and uh, i know we've run out of time but i was hoping that we can do a quick round again uh, between the panel so that any questions that people uh, a lot of questions have been posted and i have requested if the panel can touch upon any of the questions and respond to them and if each one can take 2 minutes i know anant has to go so if anant you want to make any closing remarks quickly or touch upon any of the comments or questions that would be very nice yeah yeah and and you know just uh, thank you then it was great to uh yeah that perspective and and obviously who had also brought that you know as someone who's neither a i would say a frontline ngo and not not someone with like a corporate um i think in a way it's interesting to see the two perspectives right and and like you i think correctly said um what is clear to both parties is the current way of operations won't cut it what is also clear to both parties Uh, and i'm for a minute saying government and community are always there so in in a way i think uh, these two parties will need to figure out how to work together and with uh, you know the the actors who are always there uh, but i think the one thing which uh, i'd like to maybe end, share and end with is the need for multi stakeholder long term strategic vehicles is here what i mean by that is you know if if we need to saw and you know a really small example is the social compact but like if you take um, if you take a livable city if you take how do you think of um, how do you think of you know health how do you think of any any topic in urban areas 
Each of them is a 10-year mission. Each of those 10-year missions needs 100 stakeholders. Each of them needs a combination of policy, advocacy, action, and feedback loops. And, and each of them needs upwards of maybe $100 million, right, total. And none, none of these can be fulfilled by anyone. So in, in a way, I think it's almost interesting to see that the time for you know, very clear vehicles is coming. And, and uh, the real question is then, how do these vehicles come into place? In the for-profit sector, these vehicles are there because there are mechanisms to trade. So then the real question here is, what are those things one goes after? What are those outcomes? Who are the people who will sort of make sure that things are happening? Uh, because you know, the time for small solo bets is, I think, has to give way to the time for longer term bets. And thank you for sharing what you did, Zara, because in a way, I think none of these bets will happen in isolation. But, but the main question is who makes the first move? And how do these bets become the norm and not the exception? Uh, but thank you, Nilima ji, and thank you everyone for uh, a very, very exciting and diverse set of viewpoints. Thank you very much, Anand. Uh, uh, so who would like to go next for the closing remarks? Anyone or we can share it. Um, yeah, I, yes. I can go yes. next. I'm just going to use my two minutes to answer a question that uh, Mr. Roy has raised. Uh, I'm not sure if he's still here. But yeah, the question he raised is, um, why would uh, corporates want to fund CSO in, uh, innovations if they're going to be handed over to the government? Uh, so just speaking uh, from my experience with how uh, Sneha works. Uh, so when we plan an intervention, we look at it from the end objective that the NGO should not be there in the picture at all. So, you know, if we look at it from an eight to 10 years kind of time frame, uh, then we do plan it saying that uh, three to five years would be what where we work directly in the communities. Uh, the next, say, three to four years is when we work in what we call an indirect uh, approach where, uh, you know, it's a, it's a less resource intensive model. Uh, and where, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of the initiatives taken by the community uh, as well as the systems. And then the last one to two years is when we actually plan the handover, um, uh, you know, to the communities and the systems. Uh, so when a corporate, uh, you know, comes on board or when we're pitching to a corporate, we actually present this picture. So they do know that, you know, this is kind of the end game that we're looking at. Um, and uh, at least we've not faced, uh, you know, an issue with the corporate saying, why are you handing over to the government? So this is how we approach uh, our work. Thank you, Sangeeta. Amita, are you? Yes. Yeah, okay. So thank you. I uh, mean, a fascinating conversation. I I'll be very uh, brief and, and to the point. You know, I, I saw Dunuji asking the same question to three, four of us in a way that um, uh, how does this conversation relate to the, the topic that we have? So in a way, I think we did discuss, it was a very good conversation about, about CSR philanthropies, but I think we were, at least I was not able to necessarily link the urban question with the CSRs and philanthropies. Uh, so how do we move ahead? That just two ideas. One, I do think that there is a need for uh, donor education. Uh, that does not happen. Uh, that's something very, very serious. And, and donors are very happy educating the civil society, but it doesn't happen the other way around. So that's that's one piece. And we could try. And so that's that's a request to Inaf and Kirti ji, uh, that how do we actually try and uh, build a, a, a designed intervention where you have some traditional institutions which are doing the infrastructural civil society work. You have then some philanthropies which are doing the institutional support and CSR, which probably do the, the more direct activities. But can we try and do that? Uh, you know, An Anant is here. Dasra is one of the best uh, which could do that. But we try and actually curate it. We've also given up. Uh, many of us, we did influence a lot of donors earlier, but with the multiplicity of donors, uh, I think we are not being able to do that. So as civil society, as a collective, making seven, eight, 10 donors 
two institutional donors working on urban question, et cetera, and then try and see how do we, uh, uh, you know, at least build the narrative that I was talking of, identify some issues on which we can work. I think that that would be worthwhile and, and it is needed uh, because of all the issues we've talked of, both in terms of the, the concerns, but also the, the urban question, which has become so, so central uh, to our future. Thank you. Thank you, Amitabh. That's an excellent suggestion. And like you said, there is no shortcut to, to this long process of education, which we just have to invest in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Shrikant or uh, Rohit or uh, Zainab, anyone? Yes, Shrikant. Sure. Uh, I think the journey of human development in India cities, the, 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 the main actors in the plot are communities and then governments. So uh, I think the obligation of civil society and philanthropists is to, is to empower communities and to empower and enable communities and empower and enable local governments. That, that needs to be the focus. Therefore, philanthropists need to be humble. They need to have uh, a longer time horizon. Uh, and instead of focusing on outputs and outcomes, which I think should predominantly be uh, something that communities and governments care about, I think civil society and uh, philanthropists have to care a lot more about inputs and processes without which outputs and outcomes won't get generated in the medium to long term. So in the short and medium term time horizon, civil society and philanthropists have to work together to focus on inputs and processes. In this case, the input and process is to strengthen governance, citizenship and democracy in cities. And for that to happen, we need probably, I may sound idealistic, but we need to invert the accountability. Why are we accountable for money in this sector? Just because philanthropists are giving money, civil society is accountable to philanthropists. I think philanthropists and CSR need to be accountable to civil society and civil society needs to be accountable to communities. Uh, and, and if you need to achieve what we want to achieve in human development, the direction of accountability needs to be that. Uh, but I think one, if I had to mention one word to philanthropists and CSR, uh, uh, it would be humility. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Very, Thank you very much, uh, Shrikant. Incidentally, uh, I think uh, Anant had quoted Michael Sandel. So at the end of the book, one point that Michael Sandel makes is about the need for humility uh, to bridge this kind of artificial thing which has become between the merit and uh, those who. So, it's, anyways, Thank you very much, Shrikant. And I really like what you said about inversion of accountability, if that can happen. Uh, Yes, uh, Rohit, you want to leave Zainab with the last word? So, Sure, I think uh, high time that we collaborate. Uh, corporates come together, find out common objectives, work rather than working in silos. So it will bring in efficiencies, it will bring in effectiveness. High time that uh, the trust deficit between civil society, corporates and government is, is, is worked out constructively by sitting across the table and uh, have a common uh, perspective plan where benefits are accrued to all the stakeholders and every citizen. Uh, so I think that's one. Second is uh, uh, civil society, and this is, I, I can be very immature in what I'm, I'm observing is that, uh, there is a kind of a fear that has come in uh, amongst the civil society also. Uh, I think uh, let's embolden our uh, trust with, with the goodness that we want to achieve. Uh, let's come together. I think we are too fizzled out and so our energy and focus is fizzled out. And I'm sure there are uh, corporate houses, uh, corporate floated uh, foundations that would be happy to work on it. It's just that we need to, uh, whatever discord that has come because of certain dispension, I think that needs to be uh, retied. And uh, it's a lived space, it's a shared space. And the more trust we have, the more closely that we work, I think the better it is for all of us. Uh, those are very lim limited thoughts that I have at the moment. Very precious words, Rohit. If we can overcome the trust deficit, and there is no other way around this problem, we have to work on that. So it will solve many things. Uh, Zainab. 
Don't feel orphaned, please. Yes, over to you. Um, no, I, I, again, I mean, I don't have anything new to say, Nilavaji, frankly. Um, yes, the trust deficit is something that I have also felt a lot um, in uh, dealing with uh, many organizations that I have worked with. Uh, so that's definitely a, a little bit that needs to change. And that little bit will go a long way in terms of, you know, different parties coming together towards the same common goal. Because I, I do truly believe, and I might like maybe sort of hopelessly optimistic here, but I do truly believe that um, whether it is the CSR, philanthropy, NGO, um, civil society at large, all of us do want that, you know, we are in a better world at the end of this. So, um, so I think we need to also believe in that shared common goal that, you know, we do want a better society, we do want better communities, we want better environment, we want all of this. Um, and we also want to work towards it genuinely. Um, so if we can believe in that and then give the other person that space to uh, work with us, it will go a long way. Thank you, Zena. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very great. I will not even attempt to do beyond me to do a summary of everything that was said during the last two hours. But as many of you said, it was a fascinating conversation. And I thought that people spoke honestly, passionately, and uh, and brought so much to the table. Uh, at least it'll take me a while to digest everything that was said and, and make sense of this. Um, thank you very much, Kirti ji, for bringing us all together. And uh, I hand over the mic to you. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, I don't have a watch, and I don't know. I think you know what time it is, you know, but uh, you've been saying that in an over short time. So, but I, I really, I really wrote down some twenty points, you know, from from the discussions, and I don't, I know I don't have time to to deal with two. Uh, but I just wanted to say two or three things before I do my customary work of thanking everyone, and that is this. This was a very brilliant uh, sort of uh, conversation. Very, very brilliant. We had such very bright and capable people, and of course, young people talking. Uh, I, but I must also say that you know I feel a bit disappointed uh, from 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 our own vantage point, and that is this that, uh, and maybe because. Uh, most of the people who talked here essentially talked from the from the supply side, and we are looking at the from the need side. Uh, but uh, uh, I, on three things, I really wanted something to be said. One is this: that, and, and that was a very specific reason we were talking about. You know, I think urban space and role of civil society, and within that role of CSR. That lot is happening uh, uh, in the urban sector. A country of 638,000 villages, which was predominantly rural, in 30 more years is going to become predominantly urban. And we all know that most of what is happening to our cities is probably wrong, starting from development model to what we are doing to our river, what we are doing to our environment, what we are doing to our people. Uh, and there is a crying need for connection. There's a crying need to, to do things differently. There's a crying need to kind of you know, find alternative actors and leaders. And what one thought, and, and that is why I say that, uh, uh, and even however small that work is, the situary thing we are doing, Citizens Urban Initiative, is basically saying that if you're looking for characters, if you're looking for way, new ways of doing things, if you really want new perspective, vision, and understanding of how do you deal with cities, the, the conventional players are not going to do it. It's not going to come, that alternative is not going to come from government. It is not coming, going to come from academic institution. It is not going to come from business, is not going to come from professionals. 
And by default, we say, is it possible to look at civil society and, and its role play in, 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 in looking for this alternative? No one says that you know, Tani, the civil society has the capacity and ability. Question is, how do we build it up? And within that, how small, what role could, 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 uh, could, could, could CSR do? So that was one thing which I was very, very keen to hear. I'm also very keen to believe that we are not on the wrong track that we have got to find alternative ways of doing things and therefore alternative mechanism and alternative actors. And that probably has to come from the live, widely defined civil society. I don't think we are wrong. And I think I need to kind of sit down with all of these people. Maybe we require a second webinar or a third webinar, but we've got to kind of deal with this, I think, uh, 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 more, more creatively and, and more, uh, more engagingly. I also wanted to kind of uh, uh, tell Rohit, uh, uh, and I think he, he, he said it very beautifully that you know, don't look at CSR, don't look at corporate. And uh, uh, I, I understand my dear friend Dunu is somewhere, I think, you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the meeting, and he would curse me. But idea is this, that you know, we should also exam, look at uh, CSR as a conduit to, to reaching and talking to corporate. There's no, no doubt that they're required to be told. They're required to be, I think, you know, uh, not only really educated, but I think, you know, told that I think, you know, the challenges of development requires uh, them to commit and they commit in, in a very, very different kind of way. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, it, it, it's important. And the third small point that I like to make is this, that if someone thinks 2% is small, I believe large number of civil society people think 2% is big. I understood that if under, under CSR in the next five years, you're going to put together 100,000 crore, this kind of money the sector has not seen before. And this is resource served sector. It needs resources. But it needs resources to do all kinds of things. And therefore, I think, and as Zainab said, this is a, 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 a young uh, sector, I think, in the CSR. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's new. Uh, I, think, you know, I think we should really try and work molding it so that I think you know, the resources move in the right direction and there is the right impulse in terms of how it happens. So uh, those are kind of three very quick, quick comments, but I have a large number of questions which I don't really have time to ask for. Having said that, let me kind of come back to my, 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 my organizer role and thank everyone for this particular wonderful meeting. So thanks first, Nirimaji, for sparing time and uh, uh, investing a lot of energy in putting this together uh, uh, and of course uh, anchoring it very creatively so thank you very much uh, uh, I also must uh, thank uh, the distinguished panel uh, for this uh, very uh, enlightened discussion uh, uh, and a uh, number of new ideas and perspective that has been shared and uh, it will be uh, it's only proper that you know, I thank everyone personally. So thank you, Amitabh. Bhai, I think I'm going to catch up with you at some point very soon. Ananji has left, uh, but you know, brought in some tremendously interesting ideas and want to talk more. Rohit ji, we, we already made a promise that we will get together to talk more about this and how to take it further. Sagita ji, thank you for coming in and, 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 and sharing your experiences. Trikanji, uh, we are partners in this, you know, however, wherever it goes, but we've got to take it further. And Zainab, thank you very much, not only making time for this, not only attending this, but helping us, you know, I think, you know, uh, over, over months, in fact, uh, even longer in, in, in looking at this whole, whole aspects. 
I must also thank my colleagues, which is Rajesh, uh, who has been helping very much in putting this together. Uh, also, Nita, who is not here in America, but continues to kind of guide and support and telephone people. As a matter of fact, two people who came in from the from the corporate essentially because of her intervention. So thank you very much, Nita. And of course, thank you very much, Ankisha, who is behind the scene and making this, this possible. Uh, it's, uh, 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 we, we all have felt uh, richer in terms of ideas and understanding today. And uh, I hope uh, we'll find more time and energy uh, Nirimaji, under your guidance, so maybe another one more webinar on the subject, uh, get more people to come. Uh, we have uh, developed a lot of understanding today, use that in order to kind of look at the second one. So thank you very much who is there in the audience. Thank you very much the panel. Uh, thank you my colleagues and thank you Nirimaji for, for making this uh, a wonderful experience. Thank you very much.